<laughs> That's what follows both ways, right? <laughs> well, good evening. We are in the uh, time of the year that it's dark by, what, 4.30 it seems like. And, man, it seems like it ought to be bedtime. But we're glad you're here. 679 will be our first song. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. End of that. We'll sing verses 1 and 4 of this song. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and let's sing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon His promise Just to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee. Savior friend and I know that thou art with me wilt be with me to the end Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him more and more Jesus Jesus Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. <clears throat> Next song, 650. 650, send the light. <clears throat> Sing verses 1 and 4 of the song as well. Let's sing. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love, send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above, send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. <clears throat> Song before we have our scripture reading and our opening prayer, 601. 601. <clears throat> My God and I. We'll sing all three verses of the song. <clears throat> Let's sing. My God and I go in the field together. We walk and talk as good friends should and do. We clasp our hands, our voices ring with laughter. My God and I walk through the meadows here. We clasp our ring with laughter 
laughter, my God and I walk through the meadows here. He tells me of the years that went before me, when heavenly plans were made for me to be. When all was but a dream of dim conception, to come to life a verdant glory seen. When all was but a dream of dim conception, to come to life first birth and glory see my God and I will go for it together we'll walk and talk as good friends should and do this earth will pass and with it come and try but God and I will go unendingly. This earth will pass, and with it come untrifles. But God and I will go unendingly. Tonight's scripture reading comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. From whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Let's all go to God in prayer. Our Father God in heaven, hallowed be thy name throughout heaven and earth. Father, we, we have had a great day, your day. But we've really enjoyed it. You've given us a terrific day, and we thank you for that. We've come here tonight to honor you, to honor your son, to lift up our voices in song, praising him, praising you, and encouraging each other. Thank you for this opportunity. Father, we are about to hear a portion of your word preached to us. We pray, Father, that we'll be attentive, put the world out of our minds. And as we are in this oasis right here, among your children, that we can be comfortable and listen to what you have to say, and that we'll take it into our hearts and then take it out into the world and let others know the happiness and the promise that we have with you. Father, thank you so much for all that you do for us. We say thank you. We can never thank you enough, and we thank you now again. Be with us now as we enter into this study of your word and this worship service to you, the one and only living God. For we pray in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Our next song, number 851. I'll fly away. 851. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. Let's sing. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then, Ah uh... 
glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Yeah. If you'd like to mark your books, you can do that at page 945. 945, that will be your invitation song at the close of our lesson this evening. <clears throat> song before Brother Russ brings us our lesson this evening, 884. 884, earth holds no treasures. We'll sing verses 1 and 3 if you'd like, you may stand. <clears throat> Let's all sing. Earth holds no treasures but perish with using. However precious they be, yet there's a country to which I am going. Heaven holds all to things I've come to know is how precious our children are. Don't you think so? Ah, yeah. uh, their children hold such a dear heart, place in our hearts for every one of us to know that our grandchildren do. I have one great great grandson right now. His name's Isaac. And I'm going to tell you, that, that little rascal, five years old now, Ah, uh, the joy that he brings to our life and knowing that uh, it's too long before we have the opportunity to be able to see these young ones. But these are treasures to us. One of the greatest treasures that you and I have that you and I can face is being a family, family of God. Those who are, have been visiting with us, those who have come to know us by the assembly that we have on Sunday mornings, night, Wednesday night. It's a family that loves one another, gets along with one another, enjoys one another. And that's what a family ought to be. It's the kind of being united, the togetherness that we studied about this morning when we talked about the unity of the Spirit. When the church itself finds within its very spirit the, the overwhelming feeling that is part of us, that we find gladness and joy and blessedness by being together. Of the mind, that we will come and we will, like Isaiah said in chapter 1, reason together our spiritual reasoning that we want our understanding be in tuned with what God's will is for our lives.
the focus of our faith. Tonight we're going to be talking about the unity of faith and what that means. That the focus of our faith will be centered upon the very hope that we know what the Bible teaches. We are saved by faith. Faith that we have in God. Where without faith it is impossible to please Him. They who would come to God must believe that He is, that He is a rewarder of them who diligently seek Him. A faith knowing of God's great love, for God loved the world, didn't He? That He sent His only Son to die on the cross of Calvary for you and I. Christ didn't come into this world to condemn the world in His own words to Nicodemus, but He came that those who would believe in Him might be saved. The joy that we have in knowing our Savior and what we do and say by building up one another to worship Him, praise Him, glorify Him in the assembly like we have tonight and every time the church itself comes together. Our study is found in the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. I hope you'll open your Bibles. Because as we study this chapter, we're going to understand the exalted Lord. Paul who talked about how wonderful it is to be pursuing, endeavoring, chasing, finding, keeping the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, speaks to us concerning the seven golden, golden things that make the body of Christ so spectacular, so special to the world that's around us today. Tonight we're going to be thankful to God that God knew in his heart and his mind that in order to put in the mind of man, he had to send the paraclete, the comforter, the counselor, the guide, he who would speak to us in truth, that the apostles themselves, when they put pen to paper, pen to parchment, left for you and I an eternal word, Knowing what the Bible says, that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. It will remain there forevermore. That's why the Bible still has outsold and outlasted the great books of the world itself. Because in the pages of these 66 books is the eternal heart, mind, purpose, and plan that God has. When I looked for a cover for my Bible, I, I looked at what was written to Jeremiah in the very long ago. Because Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, God looked down upon that plague that, that was going to be upon his people. Here was an old prophet, an old preacher, an old exclaimer of the word of God, trying to get people to change their ways. To refrain from sin. To run away from sin. No longer to serve sin. And that young man preaching as diligently and as hard and every day from early morning to late at night found a people that would not. And yet God said it to him right here like it says right here. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God knew upon the sinner would come his condemnation of 70 years there at the hands not only of Nebuchadnezzar, one of the meanest men the world had ever known, but also of Darius, Artaxerxes, even on through the time when Alexander the Great, after Cyrus had let them go, and he was conquering the then known world to him, they read to him, they read to him from that Old Testament part that this was the plan of God. And Alexander, you are part of God's plan and a God's purpose. God loves his children. And thereby he bestowed upon them in the infancy of time and his infinite wisdom a purpose. He fulfilled that promise that he gave unto the church, to the apostles. There that he had made in Luke chapter 24, Acts chapter 1. That when from on high they would be endowed with power. 
In chapter 2, the Holy Spirit of my God came down upon them, set upon them as, as, a, as a fire. And that fire began to burn not only in their belly, but it began to be uttered through their speech. Every man from all nations had gathered in Jerusalem, and every man heard the gospel being preached in their own language. God wanted to convey to them the hope of what the church was going to be. Here in these gifts, it was given by a Lord who emptied himself from heaven. That's what the Paul is writing about there. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean but that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. That's what Paul said to the Colossian church. That we are complete in him. Nothing lacking. That's why we have the Word of God. That's why it should be a part of our study every day. Because when we think about how incomplete we are, how lacking we are, when we're in that moment of our day to be lonely and we wish somebody was listening, the Word of God says that. All Scripture is inspired of God. That literally means... God breathed. God breathed upon those apostles in Acts chapter 2, his breath. He filled them with his word, and they took that word to Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. It's the same word when you put it in your heart and apply it to your lives, will change your lives. It will take you from a sinner, and it will make you a saint. The gift that God has given us, first of all, through the promise and through the purpose of His plan, is what I've got to commend you for. You see what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 4, when he said in verse 11, and he, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. God knew that it was through the means of instruction. That's why I'm so thankful for those who had signed up and those who will sign up to become teachers when that moment comes. When we have young people as small as little Arabella right there and smaller who need to hear songs like Jesus Loves Me, who need to be taught the importance of of what it is to understand God's love and God's grace and God's goodness in your life. God had given to you and I instruction so that our spiritual lives will grow. So can you imagine how marvelous it is when we come together at 9.30 on Sunday mornings in Bible study or the worship service on Sunday mornings, and you on Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights when we are together with one another, we're studying God's Word. These individuals were given for that purpose. In the plan of the church, it is so important to know, even in our own lives, where we're lacking. Where do we fit into that plan? Where do we fit into that plan? If you've never heard it, hear it tonight with its directness and what is sincere. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. You may not be as big as Moses. You may not have a name even as a little smaller like Aaron in the Old Testament. And I hope and pray we're not like Pharaoh when we're studying from the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. For God said, I raised him up that I may prove to the world my power. May God use me for his purpose, his plan. But may that plan be for my good and not for my demise. 
May he lift me up. Pharaoh wouldn't listen to his word. Pharaoh wouldn't hold to that word. Over and over and over again until ten plagues, the mighty outstretched arm of the Almighty reached into his life and finally it took the life of his son. Oh, did that shake him up. Will it take a tragedy in our lives to realize how important living for God is? Isn't it so important for you and I to live as God has planned for us to? We live in a selfish world. We live in a world where the world around us, our friends, our neighbors, are teaching us, fulfill what you want. You only go around twice. How many times have I seen that on the Internet, on YouTube, and other places? Our lives in this old world can have all of its treasures. But I know what my Lord said. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? To have all the pleasures of this old world, to have all the riches and all the lands and all the properties that are there when it comes to the point of standing before the judgment bar. What excuse might we give? We need to know that God has laid out a plan. It's there. It's right in front of us. And it has been here for time and time eternal. That he wants us to seize that opportunity. You see, as teachers and as learners of the lessons in God's word, you and I know that what Paul says and he means by what he does in verse 12 in verse 12, the Bible says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. There are three things mentioned right there. For the perfecting of the saints, for the equipping of the saints. That New Testament word there means supplying what you need. You know, it's sort of like Mary Bell and I. There was a time when Arabella, and we still loved cook breakfast. We loved cook eggs early in the morning or almost any time. We scrambled them. Oh, all we needed was an old fork out of the drawer or whatever. But now she's learned to love them over easy. She wants them a little runny. And that's quite all right. But I remember getting the pan out, preparing it, turning the eye on. Here we are. We're in the middle. We've got the eggs in there, and it comes time to flip them. I looked over to my left where Jill keeps all those little utensils, and guess what I did not find? Oh, my goodness, was I in trouble right then and there. That little egg spatula was not there. You know, it's somewhat like our lives sometimes. We go on and we get pursuing the things of day-to-day -day living and trying to live a life right there, and we're enjoying it like two, two wonderfully prepared eggs in the morning. We know that it's satisfactory to us like an old egg has all the proteins there. But we may not have that necessary thing, and that's what Paul says. God says, I know there's something in your life that you're not equipped with. You're not equipped with it. And what he wants to do is to that mechanic who needs to pull the drawer open, reach over there and grab that flat blade screwdriver, and all he has is a Phillips. You can't do much with that bolt without the right tool. Studying God's Word. Learning to apply it to your life, getting deep within it, is going to do something more. It's going to make us, in the second point, and I believe, at least in my studies of God's Word, it's going to help you and I as saints for the work of the ministry. That we learn what to do, and we learn how to do, and we learn when to do. Living the kind of Christian lives we ought to be about. It lets us be better servants in our Lord's kingdom. And that comes with more of the knowledge that we have of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And it also gives us the opportunity of knowing that our goal, our purpose is in Brother Al's prayer as these men of this congregation stand before us and pray. To build us up. To edify us. To lift us up. I don't know about your Christian life and living, but there are moments in my life where I'm low. Where I'm low and I need to be lifted up. And there is no greater family than to be able to hold to the shirt tail of a Christian who's already, so to speak, on his journey to heaven than to reach up and grab hold of it and just hold on to it. That's what the family of God being together is all about. We want to be lifted up. And that's the purpose of being able to be teachers of the Word of God. Notice that he says in verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith. There's our lesson title. The unity of the faith. Let me convince you to know God's Word that we are saved by faith like Paul said there in the book of Romans chapter 8 and in verse 1. Let me let you know that we don't have to be tied up searching for faith because the faith has been once and for all delivered to the saints. Beloved, I write this very, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, it found it necessary. Now notice Jude. Jude said it was necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. The faith is challenged. We are challenged by Protestantism. We are challenged by Catholicism. We are challenged by hedonism. We are challenged by almost every ism that is out there. So is it important to know the faith? Absolutely. Can I know the faith? The faith has been once and for all delivered. All you have to do is believe in God, believe in Jesus Christ, believe that He has given us instruction through His Word, and you and I can be on the sad path of the commonness of what faith is all about. Jude says there in verse 3, to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. I want you to notice there the words of the Holy Spirit. Till we come. It's a time thing. It's a time thing. To know that each of us are on different levels. There are those of us who came into the body of Christ by my obedience when I was 14. We have 18-year-olds now celebrating birthdays. There are so many like Brother Buck that we had baptized later in life. We thought God wouldn't give him enough time to ever obey the gospel, but he did. He wasn't with us long. But his faith was there in the very purpose of life and living. Till we come, God knows that we're not all alike. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, as he did, in verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now right there can be a real problem about growing. Brother Roger Allen, one of the elders there at the Skyline Church of Christ, has one of the most moments beautiful in his prayer. When he'll say, Lord, we're just common folk. We're just simple folk. We're not high-minded high above everybody else because we know we're just we're like everybody else. We all get up in the morning. We all go to sleep at night. We're all one or another. Pride. Paul's talking about pride there. Pride will keep you from growing. Selfishness will keep you from growing. 
but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one of us the measure. Look at, listen now, the measure of faith. He's talking about to each of us. That's the why I can say confidently and reverently and to every individual of us who are here, God has a plan for you. And when you and I are here a part of the body of Jesus Christ, then each of us can be used to the greater good and glory of our Lord's plan. For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ, individual members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Now, now, now notice that. Let us use them. Let us use them. If God has given you something special in your heart and in your life and you don't use it, you'll be like that one talented man who condemned himself with his own words. Lord, I knew how mean you were. I, I knew the kind of individual you were. That's why I went and dug a hole and buried that talent and covered it up and waited for you. And the Lord says, you have condemned yourself. We've got to use what God has given us to use. Here in Paul's letter to the Roman church, he said, If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches, teaching, exhort, exhorting to exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Talking about using what God has given us to use. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Paul, what are you trying to help me to do? He says, I'm trying to get you more mature. I'm trying to get you toward the perfection that we ought to have in our Lord. Turn in your Bibles with me to the fifth chapter of the book of Hebrews. Paul writing there to the church, help to those children who were in doubt, who were discouraged, who were going through some, some very trying times. Talked about the immaturity of their faith. Is your faith immature? Is it where it wants to be, needs to be? Is it, are, you think God would be happy with where you are right now? Then let me encourage you. Because that's what God does. Paul talks about the immaturity of the Hebrews' children's faith. Verse 12 of chapter 5, the Bible says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need someone to teach you. Who are that someone? Who is that someone? That's why he gave apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors. You know? That's why we come and study. That's why we're intellectually learning. That's why we're applying the Word of God to our lives. Someone teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is, those who by reason, now notice now, of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and God says, I know how to get, get you stronger. I know how to do that. It's in learning and applying the Word of God in your life. Now listen, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged till we come. That means as long as I'm still learning and applying, as I'm coming and attending and I'm applying the Word of God that I am learning at the time, then what's happening? Why, you can't get near something without something rubbing off on you. You can't. I mean, that's just, that's just part of life and living. So if you can't learn it too quickly, that's okay. 
But as long as you're still near it, then you're going to get it. I promise you, you will. So we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Why is that important for you and I to know? Because we have lost so many in the church back into the world. We have lost so many. I worry about our young people turning 18 years old, those who go off to college, where those teachers are ungodly. They are not founded in the faith. They're founded in the hedonism of this old world. They're found in teaching the pleasures of life and living. And if they are taught that day in and day out and day in and day out, they are like Lot with a vexation of their soul. But now remember this and what Peter wrote. Peter said Lot was vexed in his spirit, but God knows how to deliver him. You see that? You remember that? So being together in the body of Christ in the hours of worship and Bible study are essential. They help us grow. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head who is the head of the church Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1 Christ is we grow up in Christ only Christ can save us only Christ will welcome us home the joy of what heaven holds for all of us now I love the last verse and thanking brother Donald for reading this scripture for us to set our hearts and our minds on this from whom the whole body, he's not leaving none of us out. The whole body. I mean, did you bring your leg tonight? Did you hobble in? How about you got four fingers and a thumb? He's talking about the whole body. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what? Every joint. Oh, now wait a minute. Oh, Brother Russ, don't read that. Fit and join together by what every joint supplies. How important is your shoulder bone connected to your backbone? You ever had a rot rot rotator cuff surgery? You ever had a tear? I have. And I know how improper the arm begins to be a little bit on the inactive side and hurt in cold weather like it does now. It takes, listen now, it takes every joint together if you don't use it, if you don't supply it, if the blood stopped from the shoulder right here and didn't come to the arm, we call that a near heart attack, don't we? What's it going to lead to? Dying. Your presence, your involvement, your togetherness right now is what keeps the whole body alive. It keeps it together. So many of us have read these scriptures and we have looked over it far too quickly. We've seen too many Christians in unstable and indecisive and so shallow in, in their Christian walk of life because it was necessary for us to be together and we held back. When we ourselves had something to give and we didn't give it, we held back. But when you put everything right there, it's like putting the team effort in everything to supply every joint according to the effectual working by which every part does its share. I'm reading from the New King James Version. But that's what the Greek words mean in the Old English. 
It takes every one growing being together. Every part does its share. What does every part, doing its part, being a part of, what will it cause? What will be the end result of it? Well, my Lord helps to answer that. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint supplying, according to the effectual working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body to the edifying of itself. Oh, God who created this vessel, and I can say like David, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I know I am. Give it enough time, give it enough means, give it enough measure to know in the intellectual understanding and thought and mind of man, I know that my God can help me. That's why we pray to him. That's why we'll pray for him for Jill when she goes in Friday. That's why we pray for Jamie's cancer. That's why, and I could keep on. That's why we pray for divine help in the things that need to be done. What we need today is the divine help that we know that God will give when we all work together. Oh, it'll build up the body. It'll help us in every respect. That's faith. That's the unity of faith. That's the faith that we all hold dear to. The simplicity of teaching the great lessons that God has given. I don't know about y'all, but I pray for spiritual progress. I pray for spiritual progress in my own life. I know there are others that I have been able to nurture or tutor or help all along because of the measure of grace that God has bestowed upon me in trying to help others. I know that somewhere in your life you can look back and say, you know, if truth be known, I really did do some good over here in brother so-and-so's life or, or sister so-and-so's life. And I truly believe that's because you've been able to walk the walk and talk the talk and you've been there. Encouraging, lifting up, giving that. When you know that's a part of the plan that God has for you, what will the inevitable progress be? It always causes growth. I've been in so many places where, where people are so discouraged. And they're only discouraged because they get outside of God's plan. They try to flip eggs with their hands on a hot stove that don't work. You got to have the right tools. You got to have the right means. And when you have the right tools, you're going to be able to do the right service to what's there. And then you're going to hear someone walk up to you and say, Thank you, Russ, for fixing my car because now I can go to the hospital or I can go to the grocery store or I can come to services when I need to. The edification that's all a part of life and living. You can't do that without knowing. You can't do that without knowing what God's plan is, what God's word is for your life. That's why it's important. And I can tell you by knowing God's spiritual progress for our life and living, when we apply that spiritual love and we know what love is, Jesus Christ said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You'll keep my teachings. And when the church continuously keeps the teachings of our Lord like the application of this lesson alone by doing what I need to do, then what can you but expect? except what God's plan called for. And that's growth. Growth in each of us individually. Growth in each of us collectively. Because without a doubt, we are connected like the hip bone is connected to the backbone. We're connected. 
And that connectivity makes us what the Bible says, a brotherhood. I hope you're a member of that brotherhood. I hope you want to be a member of that brotherhood. By the breath of God and hearing His love, He gives us the plan to believe in Him. And you do when you read and study and comprehend and know you want to be a Christian. You know that it takes a willingness of your own life to confess Him as Lord and Savior and Master. When He looked down and says, you can't be mine as long as you continue in sin, you're willing from your heart to repent of sin and say, Lord, I surrender to You. Someone like the gathering there of Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Asked Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be immersed in a watery grave of baptism. Romans chapter 6 says it brings newness of life. Not just that. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall also be planted together in the likeness of His resurrection. Let me tell you, when we're baptized, sins are washed away. And now why tarriest thou, Paul? Arise, be baptized, wash away thy sins. You cannot have forgiveness of sins before baptism. It ain't going to happen. You can't have some God, I believe in you. I have faith in you. I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer like Billy Graham when I was growing up as a Baptist. When I look, and then all of a sudden I grab this book that belongs to the Almighty. And you know what's not there? The Lord's Prayer. The old prayer right there, the salvation prayer that is often prayed like I did when I was a youngster. That prayer's not there. But I'll tell you what is there. It's the conviction of the Word of God when you call Him Master. And you say, Master, what would you have me to do? Like the Apostle Paul in his own words before others, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You know you're found a Christian, a child loved by God. He loved you if you give your life to Him. He loves us still, even though in life and living we haven't been what we ought to be. We haven't applied the talents that God has given us to be used from there. I know I've touched somebody's heart tonight. I know I've touched your toes by preaching the simplicity in love of what Paul says. You cannot be a pew packer. You cannot live a Christian life and not be used in the kingdom of heaven. You've got to be there. If you haven't been, I hope and pray, if that's between you and God, go home tonight and make it right. If living a life in this old world, you haven't lived a Christian life, and you've brought a reproach or shame upon Him outside, then you need to come forward. You need to say, Brother Russell, I need forgiveness. I need to use my life for Him and for the greater good of Him. If you need to come by way of the invitation, would you come while together we stand and while we sing? Till at the cross, Christ will meet you there. He intercedes for you. Lift up your voice. Leave with Him your care. And begin life anew.
trust always in His love. Kneel at the cross. Leave every care. Kneel at the cross. Jesus will meet you there. Thank you, Brother Russ, for that lesson. <clears throat> The Lord's table is prepared for those who may not have had an opportunity to partake of that this morning. If you need that opportunity, you can make that known by coming down as we sing the first verse of number 350. 350, we'll sing one verse. If you need to partake of that, come down and you'll be served. Let's sing. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I see, Again, we appreciate very much you being here this evening. It has been a good day, as was mentioned earlier. <clears throat> we got a few announcements I want to uh, remind you of. Uh, I want to continue to remember the Pamela Brock in your prayers. Uh, she is uh, needing prayers. Her body seems to be shutting down at this time, so please remember her and her family, if you will. Also, the Child Haven gifts will be delivered this week, so we thank you for that effort again. We are going to be having a, uh, a New Year's Eve celebration. I mean, we know the date for that. It's the 31st, right? All right, Christmas caroling next Sunday. We're going to do that next Sunday, so our plan is to, uh, to go out and get something to eat and then come back and be here by 2 o'clock, and we'll leave and, and from here and, and go out and, and do some Christmas caroling next Sunday afternoon. So remember that. We uh, prayed this morning for, for Bennett Jones. He was uh, sick, coughing, running a fever. Uh, also, homecoming and gospel meeting will be coming up in April. April the 3rd through the 6th. We'll have homecoming on April the 3rd. Brother Danny Rader from the Bridgeport Congregation will be, uh, will be speaking for us through our gospel meeting. So we're looking forward to that. Something we hadn't had, been able to do in a while, so we're looking forward to that. Jill will be having her test on Friday, uh, so please remember her uh, as, as they travel and, and then have that test in on Friday. Anything else I'm probably overlooking. So remember all those that we have on our prayer list. All right. Closing song is 574. 574. We'll sing one verse, and after that we'll be dismissed in prayer. Thank you so much for being here. Be here on Wednesday at 630 for our Bible study. All right, let's all sing. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, so again, we thank you for an opportunity to be together and spend time and worship you this evening. As we separate, please go with us and guard us, carry us safely to our homes. Lord, we just continue to pray for those that are on our prayer list, those who were mentioned this evening, that you will be with them and fill the needs that they have and give them the strength that they, have, they need to, to return to their own walks of life. Continue with us, guide us, and guard us in all that we do in Christ's precious name. Amen. Thank you.